محمد نوال محمد صلوات محمد نوال محمد صلوات Uh, brothers and sisters, we'd like to continue the program with the recitation of the Holy Quran by Muhammad Walji. Please welcome him with a loud salawat. Allah Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إن وقت الله حق فلا تخرنكم الحياة الدنيا ولا يخرنكم بالله الأخرور إن الشيطان لكم عدو إن الشيطان لكم عدو فاتخذوه عدوا إنما يدعو حزبه ليكونوا من أصحاب السعير والذين كفروا لهم عذاب شديد والذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم مغفرة وأجر كبير أفمن زين له Fast. 
Thank you very much for that uh, most beautiful recitation. Um, brothers and sisters, please can I ask you to move as far forward as possible um, so that those who want to join can join from the entrances. Brothers, please can I ask you to move as far forward as possible. Thank you. Um, brothers and sisters, the next part of the program is a Qasida by Tasim Qasim. Please welcome him again with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.
صلوات على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Congratulations to us all on the Mawlud of Imam Ali alayhi salam and inshallah I'll be reciting uh, a qasida in his honor first in Urdu with a translation on the screen uh, followed by an English version of the same one inshallah Aflaha man salla ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad मैं क्या बताऊं आपको क्या क्या अली का है क्या क्या अली का है क्या क्या अली का है मैं क्या बताऊं आपको क्या क्या अली का है क्या क्या अली का है क्या क्या अली का है फरश जमीन अर्श मुअल्ला अली का है मुअल्ला अली का है मुअल्ला अली का है अब हो गया है खत्म अंधेरों का सिलसिला अब हो गया है खत्म अंधेरों का सिलसिला अंधेरों का सिलसिला जो फे हरम में नूर जो उतरा अली का है उतरा अली का है उतरा अली का है खुद सर उठा है तक तरहा आसमान भी खुद सर उठा है तक तरहा आसमान भी हा आसमान भी सरवर ने हाथ कितना उठाया अली का है उठाया अली का है उठाया अली का है मैं क्या बताऊं आपको क्या क्या अली का है क्या क्या अली का है क्या क्या अली का है खालिक के अपने अब्द से ये इश्क देखिए खालिक के अपने अब्द से ये इश्क देखिए ये इश्क देखिए जो कुछ भी है खुदा का वो सारा अली का है सारा अली का है सारा अली का है अपने मकाम बेच के बोला ये ला मकान अपने मकाम बेच के बोला ये ला मकान बोला ये ला मकान ए हाजियो ये याद हो काबाली का है काबाली का है काबाली का है फर्श जमीन अर्श मुअल्ला अली का है मुअल्ला अली का है मुअल्ला अली का है सलवा तला मोहम्मद व आली मोहम्मद ओ पीप वॉट कैन बी सेट ऑफ द स्टेट सो वाली द स्टेट सो वाली the status of ali is it possible to comprehend the status of ali the status of ali the status of ali until today people deny the rights of ali yet claim to follow the prophet who said so proudly yes he said so proudly like Harun is to Musa as how Ali is to me how Ali is to me how Ali is to me I am the city of knowledge come to me through Ali come to me through Ali come to me through Ali whoever I'm the master of his master is Ali his master is Ali his master is Ali When Maryam had left her city to give birth to Isa Allah he eased her pain by sending dates from the tree heavenly dates from the tree and for his birth Allah opened the Kaaba for Ali opened the Kaaba for Ali opened the Kaaba for Ali Philosophers they traveled far and wide seeking answers debating contemplating upon matters unanswered these matters unanswered 
We're mesmerized when we recite the words of Ali, the words of Ali, the words of Ali. To those that say the Shia are those that worship Ali, we worship only Allah and intercede through Ali, intercede through Ali. Allah ensured a charity through the bowing of Ali, through the bowing of Ali, through the bowing of Ali. The freedom of Islam defended by the Zulfiqar, Badr, Hud, Khandak, Jamal, Sifin, and Khaybar, Sifin, and Khaybar, the warriors of the world and the two fingers of Ali, the two fingers of Ali, the two fingers of Ali. Many they came to ask for the hand of Zahra. This union was already made in heaven by Allah, in heaven by Allah. Sayyidatun Nisail Alameen, Amirul Mu'mineen, Amirul Mu'mineen. Amirul Mu'mineen Is it possible to comprehend the status of Ali? The status of Ali, the status of Ali Farshay zameen bi arsh mu'alla Ali ka hai Mu'alla Ali ka hai, mu'alla Ali ka hai Aflaha man sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Thank you very much for another beautiful recitation. Um, brothers and sisters, uh, we will now have a short speech by Safiya Rajan. Please welcome her with a loud salawat. Ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Alaikum. Today I'll be giving a short talk on the life of Imam Ali. Peace and blessings be upon him. Imam Ali was born on the 13th of Rajab, 20, 30 years after Umar Fiel, the year of the elephant. His birth took place inside the Holy Kaaba to Fatima bin Asad. From a young age he worshipped Allah with the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And when the moth and when the message of prophethood was declared, he was the first man to become a Muslim. He married the prophet's daughter, Fatima Zahra, and together they had four children, Hassan, Hussein, Zainab, and Umm Kulthum. During the prophet's hijra to Medina, Imam Ali bravely slept in the prophet's bed. The enemies had surrounded the prophet's house and wanted to kill him, but Imam Ali remained steadfast. He was chosen to be the leader of Muslims at Qadir al-Qum by Prophet Muhammad. However, the Muslims chose their own leader after the Prophet's death. Imam Ali retired to his house and compiled the Holy Quran in book form. He always gave advice to the Khalifa of the time whenever necessary. After the death of the third Khalifa, the people pleaded with Imam Ali to become, to become the ruler. He was the Prophet's right-hand man, trusted companion, hero of all the battles, whose victories were largely due to a result of Imam Ali's bravery. He never fled from battlefield and spent his life fighting against injustice and always upheld the truth and protected the Dao Trodden. Imam Ali had many wonderful traits. When looking at his life, what most struck me was his leadership skills. In a world where... where in a world where many of our leaders are unable to be inspiring role models, it is wonderful that we have so many within, within our religion. There is such a huge turbulence going on in the world, especially in the Middle East, and there has been massive injustices taking place. It made me think about what I want and ex expect in a leader, and what I choose to value in the people that I surround myself with, and the people who I, who I want to emulate. It made me appreciate how amazing Imam Ali was as a leader and a role model. There are countless examples of Imam Ali's sense of justice, but it was his sense of justice filled with compassion that set him apart.
A beautiful example of this was in the Battle of Khandak, when an enemy of Imam Ali spat in his face. Instead of killing him instantly, he let the man go as he did not want to kill him in a state of anger and for retribution of what the man had done to him. Instead, they were able to rejoin the battle where Imam Ali managed to kill, managed to kill his enemy in war rather than for his own personal revenge. Imam Ali's fairness and sense of justice as a leader was highlighted by the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan who said, The Caliph Ali ibn Abi Talib is considered the fairest governor who appeared during human history after Prophet Muhammad. So we advise Arab countries to take Ali ibn Abi Talib as an example in establishing a regime based on justice and democracy and encouraging knowledge. He advocated for fair treatment of all his subjects, regardless of race or religion. His compassion, no matter who it's towards, whether it was non-Muslims or Muslims, he articulated this in his famous saying, People are of two kinds, either your brothers in faith or your equals in humanity. Imam Ali was a brave leader. When we think of bravery, we often think of fighting and strength. But it was his strength of character that set him apart. His sense of justice and humility, treating people with mercy. His profound words from Nashjul Balagha struck me with a sense of awe in the, with the depth of the message. His support of the downtrodden, as well as a firm, balanced stance, recognising that the wealthy existed and should be punished for their fortune. But likewise, the poor should not be excluded and neglected and the gap between them needed to be reduced. His knowledge, as demonstrated in the National Balagha, was astounding. His concepts of, crea of the creation of the universe in the opening part of it are very deep. In addition, concepts of spirituality, ethics and governance contained in it are all, all of which continue to inspire Muslims and non-Muslims till today. His mastery of the Arabic language was demonstrated beautifully in the words such as the Waqamel, which we recite every Thursday, and some of his sermons. I thought it was extraordinary how in one particular sermon he did not use the letter Alif at all. That is like writing a speech without the letter A, which is pretty impressive. Imam Ali lived for about 30 years after the Holy Prophet died. The period of his caliphat was four years and ten months. On 19th Ramadan, 40 AH, Imam Ali was struck with a poison sword by Abdul Rahman ibn Mordan whilst offering, offering his early morning prayers. He died two, day, two, he died two day, days later, on 21st Ramadan, at the age of 63. Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein bur buried him in Najaf, near Kufa in Iraq. Thank you for listening. Salawat. Thank you very much for that excellent speech and, uh, and your thoughts about Imam Ali and uh, the notion of justice, which I'm sure we'll be talking about um, later on as well. And brothers and sisters, um, on the topic of justice, we uh, will now have a short poem by um, Fatima Valji. Um, please welcome her with Allah salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I wrote this poem whilst considering how racial injustice and power structures collude and coincide, and how the repression and liberation of black Americans and Palestinians are connected in various ways. How oppression is systemic and global, and so solidarity must also transcend particularity and exclusion, because in the end, Truly, none of us are free until all of us are free. The poem is called Solidarity. I know the blood-curdling dread 
of a gun's cold barrel pressed into my clammy neck, arms twisted so far back, I feel a searing, jarring crack before all goes black. I know the choking pain when the cool muzzle is replaced by pressure so suffocating, there's no relief until my writhing limbs go limp. I know prison cells dark as hell, designed to dehumanize, control, and terrorize. And yet, the struggle of black Americans and stateless Palestinians coincide beyond our partially parallel lives. Our fate and fight are intertwined by American-Israeli collusion and lies, enabling the world's last white settler colony to thrive on the blood and brutality of war crimes, checkpoints, curfews, and apartheid. So as I'm suffocated by white cops and close my tired eyes, your tears and agony are also mine. For the powers that threaten our black American lives also sanction and support Palestinian occupation, expulsion, erasure, genocide. Thank you. Um, brothers and sisters, uh, today's main talk will be by Sheikh um, Arif Abdul Hussain. Please welcome him with a loud salawat. Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Um, Sheikh Arif Abdul Hussain founded the Al Mahdi Institute in 1993 and currently serves as its director and as a senior lecturer in legal theory and philosophy. Um, he's the author of the, Isla of the Islam and God Centricity series, which presents the essential message of Islam through a fresh reevaluation of religion and human purpose. Please welcome him again with Salawat Allah. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <coughs> Alhamdulillah, Rabb al Alameen, Aladi Hadana Li Hada, Wama Kunna Lina Tadia Lula and Hadan Allah. Thank you. Was Salatu was Salam Allah Asherafil and Bia, Wal Mursaleen, Wali Hit the Yabin at Tahirin, Was Habihil Muntajabin, Waman Tabi Ahum Behsan Ila Kiami Yomidin. Smilah Rahman Rahim, Rabbi Sharahli, Sudri, Wayasirli, Amri. وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أسعد الله أسعد الله يامنا ويامكم wonderful uh, by the way thank you for having me here I feel very blessed beautiful kasida and, and a lovely speech capturing the life of Imam Ali salamu alayhi. Now we have appreciated Imam Ali in terms of his deep-seated spirituality, God-centricity, connection with God, and effacement in the being of God to the extent of him losing his own self. We have appreciated him in his sense of morality and righteousness. We have also looked at aspects of his humanness and how he overcame his human frailties, how he was able to humble himself at times as well. The one thing I thought to myself was that I've never actually paid much attention to the sense of Imam Ali's justice. Now, although this talk will, for the sake of blessings, cite a few examples of his justice, but the talk is geared towards the understanding of what is just and what is justice, and then maybe its application to the Islamic law. But 
for a person to be just at that level and so just is remarkable. It seems to be something that is quite impossible within humanity to be just absolutely, if I can say that. So for example, if you were to look at us in our capacity, whether we are what we call ourselves the masses or religious leaders who represent the blessed Imam in his absence, who represents the Prophet, we find justice lacking through and through in the processes, in their judgments, in their understanding of issues. There is no sense of real justice, and we can see this lack, and I will say this unashamedly. There is always favoritism, there is always oversight, and, and, and that's what it means to be a human community. But in the midst of that, to see this figure so just and so committed to the precepts of just or justice is remarkable. And we will say, well, if there wasn't anything else to this man, his understanding of justice in itself is enough for us to give him that sort of a semi-divine status. He's not an ordinary person. Now, we've, we've often heard of this story, and I will narrate a few of these incidences and then take it from there, that somebody goes and visits him in the depth of the night, and uh, Imam Ali asks him, is it something to do with me in my personal capacity, or if, have you come to see me as the head of state or the Khalifa? He said, no, I've come to see you in your personal capacity. So he blows out the candle and lights another one. And he was asked, well, why did you do that? He said, well, that is the candle of the treasury, uh, belong, uh, bought from the treasury for the affairs of the Muslims. This time that I will spend with you is personal time, and therefore I cannot utilize what is not rightfully mine. Now, which person has that sense of justice? <laughs> we will go through a few examples. But now I don't know if this statement is factual or it's just been attributed to Imam Ali, but if you were to ask me from the depth of my heart, I will say it's very factual, even though it may not be sourced accurately. That famous statement of Imam Ali that if the seven heavens, with whatever they contain, is handed over to me in return for me snatching a husk of barley from the mouth of an ant unjustly, I would not do so. That level of righteousness and justice, I mean, which man can even utter such words? And you know, if it is true for anybody, it is true for this great man. Now, going into certain examples that reflect his sense of justice and then building on what is justice and then its application, which will not be shocking to you people, I know, but it will be shocking me while I speak. Salawat. I'm just prompting the shock in your heads, by the way. So <clears throat> he saw his daughter, Lady Kulsum, wearing a necklace on an occasion. And he approached her and he said, where did you get this necklace from? She said, from the treasury. I took it for a night. Oh, by the way, I have to qualify. Shia Sunni sources are all mixed up here, yes? I don't know about the authenticity of any of them, but they are quite popular. So he asked her, where did you get this necklace from? She said, from the treasury. So he went to the one in charge, and he said, did you give her the necklace? He said, yes, for this night for her to wear. It's a special night for her. And he said to him, Imam Ali said to the person in charge, and how many people's daughters have the privilege to walk into the public treasury and ask for a necklace for a night. You should not have done so. It was an unjust act. In his famous khutbah recorded in Najul Balaga, in Sifin, he said, oh people, I have rights upon you and you have rights upon me. Now, this is a leader who is actually saying to the people that you have similar lights upon me. 
if we discharge each other's rights, then we can hope for permanence, perpetuity, long-term survival, if these rights are given appropriately and are upheld. So here again, we are seeing a sense of righteousness and justice that you give me my rights, I give you your rights. A ruler is not above the subjects. There are responsibilities that rulers have towards the subjects and accountability. On an occasion, after the arbitration, I believe, with Muawiya, Muawiya's forces had attacked a village that was under the caliphate of Imam Ali, under the rule of Imam Ali. So Komei writes to Imam Ali, and he says, but we can retaliate. We can counterattack. We can attack the village from where they came. Imam Ali writes back to Komail and he said, I did not imagine, O Komail, that you would suggest such a thing to me. Is everybody okay? So, on an occasion, Muawiyah's forces attacked a village within the domain of Imam Ali's Khilafah. Everything okay there? So if we can just calm down and s stop talking, I can continue. Sorry, I don't mean to be rude. Sister, sorry. So Muawiyah's people attacked a village under the control of Imam Ali. So Komail suggests that let us attack them. This is what we would call collateral damage. Imam Ali writes a very stern letter to Komail, and he says, I did not imagine that you could even think of suggesting such a thing to me. The perpetrators of the crime are long gone, and what you suggest to me entails the destruction of innocent life. How did you even think, O Komail, that I would consent to such a thing? Now, from here you can see that this man is quite remarkable. He doesn't believe in this collateral damage business or ends justified by, or means justified by, ends. In another place in Najul Balagha, he said, had I wanted to, I would have consumed of the finest wheat. I would have consumed of the finest, I would have consumed the finest wheat, the sweetest honey, the softest clothes. But is it right for people to call me the commander of the faithful and then I do not share in their trials? For there may be people in Yamama, distant from where he was, that may not have any hope of a morsel whose livers are burning. Here again we see his sense of utmost justice and righteousness. I've read this somewhere, that in the time of Imam Hassan's imamat, when the Khilafat went over to Muawiyah, that a woman went to Muawiyah and she complained about the ill treatment she received from one of his governors. And as she began to complain, Muawiyah said, how dare 
you complain against me of my own governor. The audacity with which you come here. At that point, she recited a poem that indeed, righteousness and justice remains concealed within the chest of one hidden beneath the earth. So he said, what do you talk of? She said, I went to Imam. He said, she said, I went to Ali and I complained about his governor and his unfair treatment to me. He immediately wrote a letter and he said, as soon as this woman comes to you, give her her share, rightful share. Consider yourself absolved of your duty and report to me at once. And he had tears in his eyes and he said, oh Allah, you bear witness that I have commanded them to, to act fairly amongst your creatures. And Wawiya said, indeed, Ali was one like that. And we see this with Uthman bin Hunayf, that when Uthman bin Hunayf was invited to a banquet and the news reached Imam Ali, he wrote back to Imam Ali. Imam Ali wrote to uh, Uthman bin Hunayf and he said, how can you be a governor of mine and accept an invitation to a gathering that calls only the wealthy and the dignitaries and leaves aside the poor people. And I hear of the things that you ate. Again, his sense of righteousness that you cannot do that. It is actually unjust for you to do such a thing. He says in Najul Balaga on an occasion, I'm just giving this example to build on the whole notion. He says in Najul Balaga that Akil came to me, Akil obviously his, his brother, for a fistful of your barley or your wheat. And I saw he brought his children with him. Their faces were bony and pale, their hair unkempt. When he asked me for some, for some wheat or barley, I heated a rod with fire. And when it burnt red, I drew it near to his skin. And he screamed. He said, oh, Ali, do you wish to burn me? He said, how strange, you scream at the prospect of the worldly fire prepared through jest and you invite me to the eternal fire instead? What has possessed you, Akil, to even think that I would give you more than your share of the wealth of the Muslims? and will become unjust and face Allah on the day of Qiyamah. Then again, he is saying, in Najul Balaga, I would rather stand bare feet on thorns, be enchained and dragged upon my face, than to commit an injustice or an unjust act against the creatures of God and then face God on the day of Qiyamah being answerable for that. And then face God and my Habib, the Prophet, on the day of Qiyamah. We see all of these examples. These are examples of Imam Ali's justice. In one instance, when he was supposed to arbitrate and preside over a case, one of the people within the case sent him some sweets at night. And the khutbah is phenomenal, in which he says, have you brought this knitted in the venom of a snake in order to corrupt me through its consumption? What he was gesturing was that, are you trying to bribe me? So his sense of righteousness. So in all of these examples, what we are seeing is that Imam Ali is saying that these are unjust acts. But all of these acts are in the context of Imam Ali being a leader of the community. And we see this very, very Clearly. But what we understand here is that what Imam Ali was saying was that these are things that are unfair, that are not right, that are unjust. But when we look at the notion of fairness, we see that the notion of fairness does not mean equality. Notion of fairness is broader than equality. See, normally we say justice means equality, giving everybody the same amount. That's not what fairness is. That's not what justice is. Justice is fairness. And let's build into its definition and then see how we can apply it. 
fairness can mean equality. On the other hand, fairness can mean equity. For example, if a grown person were to commit a crime, we can give them the share of punishment owed to them through agreement of the community or the experts of the community or through divine law. But if a child commits the same crime, we will say that it is actually not fair to punish the child with the same punishment that we are giving to a grown person. Now, somebody will say, well, there has to be a cutoff point between a child and a grown person. So we put an arbitrary cutoff point, 13, 14, bulug, 18, whatever. But you know very well that there are children of 16 that have the mental capacity that is better at times than, than mature adults of 24. And you know for a fact that there are grown people whose mental capacity, they're not insane or anything, but their mental capacity is less than an 18 year old. So we put an arbitrary cutoff point. It is not fair, we say. Nowadays, obviously, we know that punishments are based on aptitudes, yes? And rewards are based on aptitudes. We are seeing that, but that's another topic altogether. So fairness, is in actual fact assessing the aptitude and giving it its share. That is what fairness is. It is not equality, but equality is a part of fairness. So for example, and it is a bit of a convenience equality. So when we have a community, now we can't assess every situation individually. So what do we say? We say, well, this is a community Broadly, these are the aptitudes of the community. So we will stand equal, we will stipulate equal standards. And that's where you get the notion of equal before the law. Yes? Everybody gets the same share of what they are owed. So if two people commit the same crime, they will be punished equally, even though that is not just. But that is due to the frailty and our human condition and our lack of capacity to do justice. So fairness actually means equity, being equitable, giving everything its rightful share. And I want to build on that. So fairness is actually a yardstick. Fairness means to give everything its rightful due. And fairness is an existential principle. And as we move on, the hadith of the Prophet states this, that people will be judged in accordance with their intellect, not in accordance with the black and white of the law. So two people being presented in front of God for the same crimes would be judged differently. Well, you understood this and you understood this at one level equally. But there was far great insight in your mind than there was in this person's mind. It's just like saying a psychopath who does not feel empathy commits a crime. And a person who is verified by MRI scans or whatever scan that is not a psychopath due to that portion of the brain working, if that's at all accurate, then they would be more responsible than the psychopath for that crime. It's an existential principle to give everything its rightful due. Now, when it comes to leaders and people, this again is stipulated through fairness, that if a person is elected as a leader, they have different rights. People that they are ruling upon have different rights. Both of them have rights upon each other, but in a different manner. But yet, they stand before the law equally. So there is fairness would dictate difference in rights, and fairness would also dictate equality before law, if the law is set in that way. This is all dictated by fairness. Now, if we go to the notion of justice, we will say, well, justice is intuitive. When somebody is being unjust, we will be able to say they are being unjust. 
Now, if you were to ask them philosophically, what does that mean? They would probably not know. But let's say if you were to support a certain group, I don't want to make this into a political one. I've, I've, I've done that too much already. If you were to support a certain group of people, you would probably be condemned for it. Whereas if you were to support another group of people, you would be praised for it. And you know that this is very, very unjust. Or democracy right now. We know it is unjust the way it's behaving or operating where the elected leaders are supposed to represent the people they have elected and the will of the people, yet when they come into power, they do not represent the will of the people and the people can't remove them. That is very unjust. It's very unfair. And we know this intuitively. We say this is unjust because it's unfair. Why is it unfair, we ask ourselves? Because what was fair was that they put themselves up for this task to execute it in X, Y, and Z manner, and they're not doing so. They're overruling the remit for which they were chosen. So we know this justice is very intuitive. We know it. But how do we understand what justice is? And I want to go in that discussion now. The metaphysics of justice. According to Plato, justice means a state of balance. And this is what the Quranic notion of justice is as well. If you look at the Quran, in so many verses, the Quran talks about a state of balance. Things being created in pairs. Things being sent in proper proportions. Things being kept in equilibrium. But if you look at Surah Rahman, for example, Ar-Rahman, Allam al-Quran, Al Khala, sorry, Ar Rahman, Allam al Quran, Khalak al Insan, Allamahu al Bayan, Al Shamsu al Kamaru bi Husban. The sun and the moon are in their precise orbits, calculated. Wan Najmu wa Shajuru yas Judan. Whereas the moon and the tree are in prostration. Was Sama Rafa'aha wa Wada al Mizan. And the heaven, he has elevated it and he has placed the scale. He has placed the scale. Allah tatgaw fil mizan. Do not transgress the scale. So he's talking about a cosmic balance here. God is talking about a cosmic balance. That the whole of the cosmos is in a state of balance. Every single thing is in precision. Then the verse says, Wala tatgaw fil mizan. Do not exceed the scales. Waqimul wazna bil qist. And establish the weight with fairness and do not deceive anyone in their scales. So he's bringing the cosmic balance right down to human interaction. So justice, according to Quran, is the state of utmost balance. But this balance does not mean equality. This balance means everything has its rightful share to bring about a beautiful equilibrium. So metaphysically, the meaning of justice is a state of balance, a state of balance not in terms of equality, but in terms of giving everything its rightful place and its rightful share. Because if you were to say balance means justice and justice means equality, then the Quran is the first one that will deny this. You're looking at the story of Hazrat Khidr. Khidr kills a child. Moses finds it very unjust. Moses says, have you killed a soul? Have you taken a life of a soul, an innocent soul, without a life, without, uh, sorry, a sacred soul, innocent and a faultless soul? Indeed, this is not a righteous thing. So Moses saw that act as unjust from Khidr. But Khidr is being commanded by a loftier realm. And Moses seeks that knowledge, that lofty knowledge. Now, how can Khidr be guilty of an unjust act? So it's unjust in accordance with understanding of equality that is in the mind of Moses. Moses is saying everybody is equal before the law. But according to Khidr, he sees justice in the sense of fairness. Everything 
is in accordance with its own capacity. In the capacity in which that child was, it was perfectly legitimate for me to take its life, even though he is sinless and does have no crime. Because Khidr is operating in a realm where he understands the notion of fairness far more accurately than where Moses is understanding it. Now I know this might sound a little strange, but fairness and justice does not mean equality. It means things are operating precisely as they ought to, given their capacities. On the other hand, the right of God. Quran says, God can forgive whoever he wants. And he can punish whoever he wants. Now we can understand, he can forgive whoever he wants. Would not constitute an injustice. Because he can make the person on whose behalf God is forgiving, pleased with whatever God wants to give him. But for God to say, I can forgive your assassin and your oppressor without you being pleased with my decision, we would say it's unjust, wouldn't we? Now, especially if God were to say, I can punish a good doer, we would say this is unjust. Yet God is saying he can do it. Now, the Quran says, in which Quran, this is where God binds himself. And he says, in Allah, Laysa bi min lil abid. God is not unjust to his creatures. So God is curtailing his own right of punishing a good doer. He's curtailing his own right. But the question is this, that if God has such a right, then God is not just, according to us. Yet God says, by virtue of ownership, I have full rights. By virtue of ownership, I have full rights. According to fairness, I have full rights. Well, we'll say that's still unjust. You see, here is where we lack certain segments of knowledge, that we have come from a life before this life. Listen to the Muharram lectures in the past Muharram. We've discussed this issue at length. There is a past life, and many of the factors of this life were decided then. So Allah says he has the right to punish who he wants, so he can punish an innocent soul. And he has a right to forgive whoever he wants, and he can forgive a criminal. So here it is. And this will be shocking. According to this verse, without God qualifying and curtailing his own right, God can place Yazid in seventh paradise if he wants to. Can anybody argue against God? Can anybody say, God, you're tyrannical, but I just can't do anything against you because otherwise you'll punish me? We don't believe in a God like that, do we? We say, God, I do not surrender to your judgment because you can burn me and I'm frightened not to, but I surrender to your judgment because I know whatever you do is right. I just don't understand how it is right. Yes? And if God wishes to punish a good soul, will we say God is unjust? We wouldn't, right? Because by definition, God is not unjust. Now, this sense of justice, of balance, is actually dictated by God. Who has created the system that is in balance? It is God, right? God has created the cosmos that displays this meticulous balance and precision. So God is above justice and fairness in that sense because he is the author of the sense of justice. But when God gives us his law, which is in the context of our existence, then the word of God has to be just in accordance with our understanding of justice. Has that gone through? God's own actions are above our sense of justice. And that's why God says, he who does good, God multiplies that good ten times over. Benevolence of God. And when somebody does evil, God curtails that evil to itself, to its own equal share. Because if it exceeds that share, then God would become oppressive. And God is not oppressive to his people. So at the level of existence, God is the one who sets the terms of the notion of justice. At the, ter at the level of giving us the law, God's law has to fall within the domain of justice as we understand it. And we want to work at this. 
So from here we can see the, what is the definition of justice. The theological definition of justice is to put everything in its rightful place, which I say is inaccurate. The proper definition of justice, which is an existential definition of justice, is to give everything its rightful due. To give everything its rightful due. Now, we will see in a future world, in a future world, that punishments will have to be nuanced in accordance with the aptitudes of the people. Because they're all very different, the way in which they commit their crimes. The intentions, the motivations, the intensity, the outcome is one. Both of them have stolen something. But the motivation, the intention, the intensity, the greed, what was the objective? These are all very different. So you can't apply same punishment to two people because you are not putting things, you're not giving things in accordance with their aptitudes, in accordance with what they deserve. So the right definition of justice at a cosmic level and within our lives is to give everything its rightful due. Now, we come to the main part of what we, I want to discuss, even though the time is finished. What about the Islamic law? If you look at the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim sort of theories, divine command theory of religious law, whatever God says is just. As we said, whatever God does is just at the creational level. But whatever God says, is that just or not? That is the big question. Because if you say whatever God says is just, and we understand justice in the same way as we understand existential justice, then that means whatever God says is eternal. And therefore, amputation of hands is a just law from the time it was given till the end of human terrestrial history. Flogging in public is just. Man having two shares of inheritance as opposed to a female having one share of inheritance is just. Man having the right to divorce as opposed to female is just. If we were to say that, then we will say, well, God's word, which is Justice appears to be unfair and unjust. And it is intuitive. We know intuitively this is unjust. Are you with me? Recite a salawat, please. Why is this? Why does God's word appear to be unjust? Whereas, the, whereas God's creative act appears to be perfectly just. There is a distinction between the creative act of God in which he creates the cosmos in a beautiful state of balance where everything has its precise share of existence and they work in harmony and God's word. Why? Because the existential work of God is salient. It's an ongoing thing. Whereas the word of God is stagnant. It was restricted in time. God's word is not continuous. The legislative word of God the revelation of God, it's stagnant, it's stuck at a time. And when God issued the word, conveying rights, what is right and what is wrong, he did so through the appreciation of the existential aptitudes of the people concerned. Has that gone through? So in 7th century Arabia, there wasn't that sophistication. If you study the society of that time, the way they existed, it, it, it was a rough place to exist in. Warring tribes, women being inherited, orphans being abused, men being made, grown men being made sons by others in order to deprive their own family of shares of inheritance. It was a very abusive community. In that unsophisticated state, it wasn't only fully barbaric. No, the whole of Islamic law is based on the conventions of the Arabs. That So they were not all barbaric, but it was very unjust. But in accordance with their aptitudes and their capacities, God gave his Sharia law. So when you look at the verse of the Quran, that if you do not find two men, then one man and two women to bear witness, so that if one forgets, the other one can remind her. What does that show? That the existential capacity of women and men were different. 
women were never allowed to actualize their rational potential. They were never allowed to take part in society and to have the ability to determine their own future and destiny. They were kept in a very different manner. And therefore the Quran says, at least if one forgets, the other one can remind her. So it shows, it shows here that the ability to retain information by women was lacking back in the day in that community. And therefore we needed two. So now you say that was the existential capacity of men and women according to which the rule was given. And that was a just rule. But just rule in accordance with the existential capacities of that community. If you were to bring that rule here today, within Britain, it would be seen as inegalitarian. And quite rightly, because women have had the opportunity to actualize their rational potential and they can retain knowledge now. So if a female were to observe something, I know that smile on your face means I never forget anything either. <laughs> According to the state of women right now, where they have actualized their potential, this rule becomes unjust. That does not mean God is unjust. That does not mean the word of God is unjust. What that means is that the word of God conveying a just rule was confined to an existential context that is no longer. On the other hand, the human community is always growing as a collective body. We are always actualizing our rational potential. We are not the same as 7th century Arabian community. And the community that comes after us after 2,000 years, if inshallah the world is still around, they will be far, far more advanced than we are, morally, intellectually, technologically. They will be thinking very differently, far more spirited beings. They will probably have lost all their bodily properties, full moral beings, maybe. They will see us as barbaric people. So now the rule of the Quran takes slaves and free slaves. Today it's very unjust. The injustice in that law is nothing to do with God or the word of God. The injustice comes about when we mistakenly give eternality to the word of God that is confined. Whereas eternality is only to the existential act of God. God creates perpetually. He's keeping the cosmos in a state of balance perpetually. But his word is stuck at a point in time. So the aptitudes are always increasing. As the aptitudes increase, laws have to be adjusted. Now the biggest problem that we as Muslims have today is that when anybody says these rules of the Quran have to change with the passage of time, we find this unacceptable because this is an affront to the Quran. You're going against the Quran. It's not going against the Quran. If that was the case, then Injil would not have replaced the law of the Torah well, or modified it. And the Quran would not have modified in parts the law of Torah and the subsequent law. If that was unjust, then the Quran would not have a notion of abrogation. I mean, it's clear. There is a verse here that is giving a rule. According to our naive understanding, this rule is infallible and eternal because it's from the divine. Now another rule comes and replaces that rule. How can an eternal rule, yes, cancel an eternal rule and yet it is within the Quran for all eternity? That doesn't make sense, does it? It just says that it has cancelled its form. The form has been replaced. Why has it been replaced? Because the circumstances have changed. People have grown. As aptitudes change, rules have to change. So justice, if it is taken in the sense of giving everything its rightful due, then that is the reading of existential aptitudes. And that is what the Quran was reading in its own context, but it is the seventh century Arabian context. And that's it. It's fixed there. Now, the essence of the Quran is perpetual, but the law of the Quran in many cases, will appear unjust. So, going back to slavery. Slavery is unjust, but 
we are now in a dilemma. If we say slavery is unjust, then we are denying the divine word of God, which is eternal, and we are denying God as well. Can you see that? This is the ishtihadi system that we have, obviously, in Najaf and Qom, the literalistic appreciation, I mean, in the main, no, not everybody, that literalistic appreciation of the text, and that is the best law, but it's unjust. How can you deny your intuitive understanding that it's unjust? It's not the best law. Now, the verse, Ar-Rijal Qawamuna Alan Nisa, that men are the governors of women, of women, look at the reason that the Quran gives. Bima Allah ba'aduhum ala ba'ad. With the merit that God gives, has given to some over others. min amwalihim. And due to the wealth that they expend. Uh, my article on that has come out, you might wish to read it. Now it's based on existential aptitudes in accordance with the existential aptitudes that God bestows upon some as opposed to others. Now, men in that community were the people who fought wars, who tilled the land, who protected, and therefore they were the maintainers and governors of women. In today's society, women have had ample opportunity to actualize their own potential. With the telos of growth, we're all growing. Today, you don't have to fight warfare by carrying swords. And in the future, warfare might be fought by drones altogether. And a woman might be far better than a man at fighting war. Today, commerce is not confined to tilling the land or building buildings. It is done on computers, so they are earning as much. So now the fadl that God gave to some over others appears to be equal for both. Now if you look at that verse of fadl and that men are governors, it was entirely based upon men actualizing their potential, existential potential, women not. Now if the women have actualized it, then the rules contingent on that verse is of two shares of inheritance, distinction in blood money, right of divorce that men have, all of these will change. So when people say that today these laws of Islam appear very unjust, they are right. If a woman is earning and providing for the family or towards the upkeep of the family, then surely she is as kawama as the man is kawam. And therefore the shares of inheritance should be equal, divorce should be equal, the marriage contract should be revised, that both have equal rights and both have rights to nullify it and divorce. The blood money should become equal as well in accordance with the value that society loses at the death of a man or a woman. So in terms of Islamic law now, we are seeing that Islamic law that is derived from the Quran and Hadith appears unjust. Not because it was unjust in essence, not because God is unjust, not because the word of God is unjust, but because of our failure to not confine it in its own context. Because justice does not mean equality. You give these rights across the board to everybody for all eternity. Justice means fairness. To give everything its rightful due. And as capacity changes, the rightful due also changes. So today, I'm going to make these sort of final remarks now. Cutting of the, or, or amputation of the hands of a thief is very undignified. You can't indignify a human by cutting their hands off, right? You can't flog people in public for consuming alcohol or, or, or whatever else, the Quranic law, because it's, undign it's undignified and it's below the dignity of, of, of those people and it's below human nobility. You know, imprisonment also does not work Rehabilitation also should be looked into. Community service needs to be looked into as well. That you are a fine human being. You should not be in that place. Rather than locking people up or cutting their hands off or flogging them in public and making them feel worthless, maybe we need to devise other methods of reforming the person. Because punishment 
is either because of retribution or protection of society or reformation. If we can protect society and if we can reform a person in a way that is more conducive to their humanity, then obviously that should replace a punishment even if it be a Quranic punishment. Because at the end of the day, that was the intention of the Quran, to bring about a worthy human community. Now, I'm going to end with this. A thief was brought to Khalifa Umar, so obviously he ordered his left hand to be cut. Then he stole again. So he ordered his right foot to be cut, just the toes of the foot to be cut. Then he stole again. So Khalifa Umar ordered his right hand to be cut. Imam Ali said, no, don't cut his right hand. He said, why? He said, because I feel a sense of pity for this person and embarrassment that he has to see to his bodily needs. He has to clean himself. He has to eat and feed himself. How will he do all of that if we cut the other hand off? Umar said, then what else do we do? He said, give him some other form of punishment, throw him into a prison or whatever. Now here Imam Ali Salamullah himself was not going directly in accordance with the injunction of the Quran that cut the hand off because he understood that at that point it becomes unjust. It was unjust to leave a person in that state where they can no longer cater for themselves. So he said, give him another punishment as opposed to cutting off his hands and I, I'll stop there. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. Um, I know that we are running short of time, but it'd be good if you could take one or two questions if that's okay. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had Sheikh Haider Hubullah who came and spoke. and one of the strong views that he laid out, which was um, interesting, was his perspective that we have to be very careful about making judgments on Quranic verses later on um, and having the view that you need to be certain or, or close to certain, or have a certain level of surety that, that something has changed and, and you don't know necessarily um, that there might be a... Uh, some sort of reason for that justice which you're not aware of. And if you don't have certainty as to the reason behind the rule, then it's very difficult to say that it is different in a different context. That, that and, and he used the example of inheritance specifically. In particular, he, he cites the example of the fact that um, a wife will earn a quarter <coughs> or an eighth and spe very, very specific items are given. And he, and he said that his view was that we can't be sure with these exact numbers that there is one driver that is, um, that is, for example, financial independence and capacity. And he said, for example, um, there were hundreds of, or there were many wealthy women or business women who were earning quite a lot. Um, and none of the imams throughout the 300 years gave any exception. So he came to the view, and he, well, he, he shared the view here a couple of weeks ago that you can't, we have to be very careful about taking such judgments unless you have confidence in it. That goes quite different to the perspective that you shared that on, from an existential paradigm, justice is, is, a, is, is, a, is a, or uh, equity or fairness is a driver. Uh, can you just talk about how you see that, that there, marriage The biggest together? fallacy within usul fiqh is this qata, certitude and yaqeen. There is no such thing as qat, certitude or yaqeen. It's not possible. And I argue this within my works and my paper. Within the existential scheme and the usul al-fiqh camp of the adliya, and the fiqh camp is mukhattiya, the fallibilists. Why fallibilists? God is saying one thing, we are not certain if we are understanding his intent. All we do is we interpret the literalistic meaning on the basis of communication occurs in a conventional fashion. That is our yardstick. Now what I'm saying here, I've just given a paper that's going to be published that, you see, Imam Mia have this notion that the laws of God are value-laden, value-based. When God says this is haram, it means there is harm in there. If God says this is wajib, it means there's benefit in there. If God says this is halal, it means there's a benefit of consumption in there, for example. So they admit that laws are value-based. According to me, these values are existential, right? 
Now I'm saying, you see, obviously you see that the values are not being conveyed by a given law. So you know that the law has lost its efficacy because the values are not being conveyed. Obviously the values are not being conveyed, right? In many, many laws like slavery, concubinage, the values are not being conveyed. The society has changed. You see right now that according to the ripened state of morality, we cannot have slavery, we cannot condone it. We can't condone beating of women. It's just not on. It is blatantly wrong and unjust. So we are saying that those values are lost. Why? Because existentially things are always evolving. They're always moving. And this point of certitude by the fallibilistic own admission is not there. Because we say we are mukhattiya, we are wrong. And we can never be certain. There is always an endeavor to be less wrong. We can never be right. Yeah, and that's the existential scheme. Now I will ask, if this is their take, then how will they argue against abrogation? Imam Ali says in Najul Balaga, there were some laws that were time bound. Some were not. What were those laws that were time bound and why were they time bound? And how can certain laws be eternal? If certain laws were time bound, then how can the others be eternal? Why was Torah tweaked by Isa? I've come to make halal some of what was haram upon you. Why would Quran tweak, totally not mention stoning to death? There is no death penalty in the Quran. It is there in the Torah, and the Prophet adjudicated about the Jewish community based on Torah, and the Quran says to the Jewish people, uphold your Torah. Why was that law not mentioned in the Quran? What occurred there? So certitude is not there. We're always operating on fallibilistic terms. We are always wrong. Now the thing is, this is, a, this is the biggest fallacy within Shia and Sunni jurisprudence that we have to be certain there is no certitude. Now, you can say, you can have confidence that this is what the meaning of the Quran is. You can have that confidence. Then I ask a question. This is what it means. And now the assumption is that it carries the value because that is the philosophical foundation, that it has the value, and this is what it means. Now I will say, the only certitude you have, or closer certitude, is that in 7th century Arabia, this rule meant this, and it carried the value. Can you say with certitude that it carries the same value today when life has moved on so much? And that's the existential perspective. I'm writing on it quite a bit. But anyway, there is no such thing as certitude. It's just fallibilism. Nothing to do with certitude. And... To be honest with you, the human condition is one that is always being tweaked. Look, what is the Islamic political system? These are just redundant questions. What is Islamic economy? What is Islamic sociology? There's no such thing as Islamic economy. It is just a fair, just economy. As we grow, we tweak, we, ma we benefit from the experiences of others, we augment it, we move it forward. Then it's moved forward even further from democracy to something else, a better form of democracy, maybe, maybe direct democracy as opposed to representational democracy. Yes? We are always learning and we're moving on. And that doesn't mean that we can't have different systems operating alongside each other because different collectivities have different rates of growth in a relativistic universe. Yeah? Anyway, that's my take. Thank you. I know there are lots more questions. Um, we'll just kind of take one more if there is one from the, from the lady side. Sipten by the question, he had raised his hand from the beginning. We just one or two more, if that's okay, from Anyone the ladies, ladies and then Sipten by. Okay, we'll take the one last question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sheikh Harif. Um, I found um, your talk very interesting. I was writing a paper on the notion of fairness, academic paper, and so I was following your argument very closely. Uh, fundamentally, I mean, this is the notion that I, de I was developing, that fairness is not something which you have to go to university to learn. It is something which you are endowed with. And as you're endowed with, the question then arises as to why we have such a fantastic fazila from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a sense of fairness. And so it is our sense of fairness which then uh, allows us to move forward with that sense to change as we go along. It is that sense of fairness that gives us the catalyst 
uh, to view the contingency of the time and then change it. Uh, would you agree that it is this sense of fairness which Allah has endowed to actually then uh, allow us uh, to uh, develop our sense of justice and our sense of equality and our sense of development and progress in the community. I just want to, to sort of join the dots that, uh, that I had in my mind. Would you say that the sense of fairness is a catalyst which allows us to then develop ourselves in the contingency of our time, taking that into consideration, and that fairness is specifically endowed for that purpose? So I'm going to go a step before that and existentially explain this. And I'm going to give an example, and uh, uh, Kumail, pay attention to this as well, yeah? 20 years ago, women were not getting equal pay as men for the same task. It wasn't seen as unjust or unfair. 20 years on, it's seen as unfair and unjust. What you just said now, we are endowed with fairness. I, within the existential scheme, call it intuitive understanding. Intuition is rooted within existence. As we, see, we haven't evolved in the last 20 years. Our features haven't changed. Our heads haven't grown bigger. So what has changed within us? What has evolved within us? What has evolved within us is the human nobility, ripening and refinement of human nobility because we are the breath of God. Metaphysically, we are the breath of God and the breath of God yearns itself. That nobility is increasing within us. As nobility increases within us, our intuitive understanding of fairness changes with it. So yes, you don't need a degree to understand fairness. It is there. It's intuitive. Intuitive means it's in sync with the properties of existence, yes? And the property of existence in this case here is our nobility, the collective nobility. As we go forward in a future world, we will say it is not fair to eat animals because it is below our nobility to breed animals for our consumption if we can have an alternative. We are saying today it is not fair or just or dignified to have slaves. But in many regions of the world, we have servants. A hundred years from now, we will be talking about servants keeping them as unfair and inconsistent with the dignity of humanity. This fluctuation is due to the sharpening and growth of human nobility. So yes, what you said I agree with, with the caveat that the sense of fairness will always change and therefore serving the community, arrangement of the community, seeing to the needs of the community, the contingent affairs of the community have, been, have to be dealt with in a fair manner, provided that the fairness is on an evolutionary trajectory. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll end there. Muhammad Umal, Muhammad Salawat. Thank, thank you all. Ziyara. Assalamu alaikum ya Sayyidi ya Mawlai ya Rasulullah. Assalamu alaikum ya Sayyidi ya Mawlai ya Nabi Allah. Assalamu alaikum ya Sayyidi ya Mawlai ya Muhammad ibn Abdullah wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah wa ala zawjatu wa fiyat al-gharra khadirat al-kubra umm al-mu'mineen Assalamu alaikum wa ala ibn ammik amir al-mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib al-Sri Rasul Rabbi al-Alameen Assalamu alaikum wa ala abadak al-Siddiq al-Tahira Fatimah al-Zahra ya Sayyidat Nisa al-Alameen Assalamu alaikum wa ala abadak al-Imameen Al-Hasni wa al-Husayn Sayyidat Ishbab ahl al-Jannah السلام عليك وعلى أمة المسلمين من ذرية ولدك الحسين علي السجاد ومحمد الباقر 
وجعفر الصادق وموسى الكاظم وعلي الرضا ومحمد الجواد وعلي الهادي والحسن العسكري والحجة ابن الحسن المهدي السلام عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا صاحب الزمان عجل الله تعالى فرجك وسهل الله مخرجك وظهورك وجعلنا من أنصارك وأعوانك والمستشهدين بين يديك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى أباه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقاعدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا فصل لهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى الطيبين الطاهرين Um, brothers and sisters, just to let you know that on Friday, inshallah, we'll be continuing with our regular Islam talks.